live from Liverpool, the Dark Paranormal, Season 8. Hi everyone, and welcome back to The Dark Paranormal Season 8. I can't believe we're already heading into the second half of this season. It's literally flew by. But don't worry, we still have five amazing true listener experiences to get to you before this season ends. And then of course, we will have our Halloween special. And I'm very confident that those Halloween episodes will be the cherry on the cake of what I think has been our best season this far. Again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's reached out with your comments, feedback, and of course, your true listener stories for future seasons. As the show grows, we want to strive to make sure The Dark Paranormal remains your podcast. And I'm just the conduit that takes your stories and uses them to remind everyone else that we're never truly alone. With that said, I think halfway through the season is the perfect point to remind everyone of our mission statement. We do not do fun and half-felt paranormal tales here on The Dark Paranormal. As the title may suggest, there will be no stories of ghostly pets returning to remind you how much they loved you. No. Here on the show, we want to tell you that there's a reason that you have that feeling down your spine when you turn all the lights off downstairs and head up to bed. There's a reason why you shouldn't put every creak, sound or noise down to the house settling. And there's a reason why you feel like you're being watched when you're all alone. We ask you to suspend your disbelief before every true listener paranormal experience For one simple reason. For just 30 minutes each week, we ask you to consider, what if? What if there really are things of darkness observing you right now as you listen to this show? And what if they're just waiting for the right moment to make their move into your life? Often when people have their first paranormal experience, It hits them like a bolt out of the blue. It knocks their belief system for six. It leaves you questioning your very sanity. And that's exactly what takes place in today's true paranormal experience. I've replayed the visuals from today's paranormal experience over and over in my head since I first read it. And I think after today's episode, I won't be the only one. However, before we get to today's true paranormal experience, I of course need to thank our wonderful team over at Patreon. When you sign up to Patreon, not only do you receive these episodes ad-free and before everyone else, you can also gain exclusive access to our Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites runs each and every week of the year, even on the downtime between seasons, meaning you never have to miss your paranormal fix. And we have over 20 hours worth of additional content over there for you to binge at your leisure. We've built our wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over at Patreon. And we'd like to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. Just like these wonderful new team members have. Danielle, Chrissy Patterson, Pedro Abreu, Melissa, Riley, Jordan Glenny, Laura H., Fiona Eckenley, Holly Boren, Kawagamin, Maya Adams, Selfie Rick, Brutato, Becca Ollett, Claire Floyd, Cecilia Logan Bill, Shania Ortiz, Jade Gilbert, Jessica Maroney, Emma Tidmore, Laura Lee Adams, Stevie Habib, Katie, Martin Green, Lee Reynolds, Valerie Wheely, Elizabeth Keister, Nadu Nicholas, and Rebecca Graham. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you enjoy all of the ad-free early release content and, of course, all of the additional Dark Bites episodes over on Patreon. If you'd like to join the team, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, it's time to lower the lights, make yourself comfortable, and, of course, leave your disbelief at the door as we hear all about an unholy, Worship.
I've listened to the show from the very beginning, and I love that you've created a space for experiences like mine to be heard. Finally, after dwelling on it for several months, I've decided to type up my experience and send it over. For what it's worth, on reading this back, even I was taken aback to actually see just what I endured during that time. I'd never before put this to paper, and day on day as I remembered more details and added, removed and edited parts, it was quite the experience to finally see it on a linear timeline. So, where to begin? I guess at the end of my university days in 2017, I'd just finished a degree in English literature from Manchester University and was debating the ifs, whats and wheres in regards to doing my master's degree. And that's when my life, my little sheltered life that I'd built for myself, began to fall apart. As anyone who's lived away from university will have experienced, you reach that point where you have a decision to make. To stay in the city which you've now made your home, or to return to where you came from, or even head to pastures new. In my mind, however, that decision had already been made many months before. You see, three of my closest friends had stated that they were staying on in Manchester, and I had a two-year relationship with my partner that was still going strong. Being someone who likes continuity, I was 90% sure I would be staying where I was. And then, my week of hell began. None of it paranormal. Basically, over the course of that week, my three friends informed me that they would be heading back to their individual hometowns for varying reasons, and no longer staying in Manchester. And then my partner, who I'd stupidly planned out the next few years of my life with, informed me that they'd been offered a job back home and would be returning to Ayrshire. Okay, I thought. Ayrshire was not in my plans. But I'm sure I could... No. Oh, I misunderstood, apparently. I stupidly thought that as we were in a committed relationship, that we would be heading to Ayrshire. But no. Of course, he didn't state at the time, I want to split up. But he did reply to every suggestion of me joining him with, good idea, but actually. One of those chats where I, as the dumpy, pathetically exhausted all my options and finally said, so the only option is for us to split up then. Of course, he jumped on that with, well, if that's what you want, I guess your mind's made up. So now my life was in freefall. I tried to stay positive and told myself that this actually meant I now have no ties and I could literally go anywhere I want. But that week hurt. A lot. It was a feeling of sheer abandonment one that I thought you'd never feel as a fully grown adult. I do believe in serendipity, that things can fall in your lap just when you need them, and that's exactly what it felt like the following week when I was scrolling through Facebook. I saw a post from a friend that I'd had in first year of uni. They were in their final year, and so we lost touch over 12 months prior. And according to this post, They were now having a ball, teaching English in Italy. Good for them, I thought, then closed Facebook and went over to Instagram. The first pic was this same person, all smiles with a beautiful sunset behind them, and a big long comment saying how moving over to Italy saved their life. Apparently they were at an all-time low, and the complete life change had worked wonders. Reading that post struck a chord with me. I almost welled up actual tears. I closed Instagram and opened Twitter, completing my usual hat-trick of social media checks that I do far too often each day. Once again, the first thing I see is a post from that friend. 
retweeting a link to the agency that he used to source his Italian placement. After double-checking that I didn't just follow this one guy on social media, I genuinely felt that this was more than mere coincidence. And so, without much thought to actually doing it, I fired off an inquiry email to the agency. Nothing ventured, right? Fast forward just six weeks later, and I was paying a taxi driver after arriving at a small house on the outskirts of Lille in northern France. Bonjour, a rather excited voice shouted over from the gate of the house. This, I would quickly learn, was Johan. Johan was the ambassador for the agency in this part of France, and he explained he was to be my contact should I need assistance or any help getting around. He had a seriously intense face. His mouth was in a constant smile, whilst all the emotional work was done with his steely eyes and ever-moving wrinkled forehead. It was really off-putting. His entire demeanour seemed forced to the point of discomfort, like aggressively welcoming. That said, I was tired from my trip, so I figured there was a high likelihood I'd read him completely wrong, and he was just a genuinely enthused person. He explained that the owners of the house would be along shortly to talk through the alarm, the heating setup, all the usual things, and in the meantime gave me a quick tour of the outside. This is a lovely quiet area, no noise, he said, gesturing with his arms open wide. Great, I smiled back. And you must see this, he said, leading me round to the back of the house and the rear garden. Look, he said, nodding at the rear wall of the house. I couldn't see exactly what I was meant to be looking at, and pulled a face which said as much. Ah, sorry, he laughed. Here. He walked over and slapped the wall with his hand. And look, he continued, walking to the side of the house and again slapping that wall. Different colours, yes? Now it was pointed out it was very clear that the wall at the rear of the house was different to the other three sides. It seemed much older. Monastery wall, he said, tapping the back wall. He stood in the middle of the back garden and pointed with both hands at the rear wall, then moved his hands as if giving an airplane safety message along and behind him. This whole area, the garden, was a monastery in the olden days. It was all demolished but for that wall, and then the house built going the other way, he said. Now it was pointed out, it was clear that the rear of the property was greatly older than the rest of the house. Bonjour, came an older gentleman's voice from the side gate. This person was introduced as Robert. Behind him came his much smaller elderly wife, Celine, smiling and giving a fragile wave. I smiled and waved back. Ah, Robert, shouted the ever-enthused Johan. After a quick introduction, the four of us walked through the home, with Robert pointing out the nuances of the house, all the while Celine just smiled and nodded. I really liked Celine. She gave off this intangible warmth and sincerity that's hard to fake, and that's why I was struck by her change in demeanour when we went to the master bedroom. Lovely big bed for you and your partner, she smiled, tapping the bed. Very comfortable. Oh, I don't have a partner. I'll be staying here alone, I smiled back. But Celine's smile dropped from her face, and it was now a face of concern. At the time, I thought she was reacting to Johan's face, a face I had also caught a glimpse of. The raised eyebrows and broad smile when I announced I was staying here alone. No chance, mate, I thought. The tour continued and we naturally found our way to the front gate as keys were exchanged. Robert gave me his number 
and explain they live just down the street, and that I should call if I have any issues. Johan then escorted the couple to their car. However, Celine walked back, cupped my hand, which was holding the keys, with both of hers, and very sternly but softly said, Keep that number safe, and call, day or night, any time. She then rubbed my shoulder, smiled, and joined her husband at the car. After politely declining Johan's help to move my things in, literally two bags, I flopped on the settee and sighed. The journey had been a long and stressful one, and I was ready for food and an early night. The agency, or Robert and Celine, had very kindly left a welcome package, containing some cold meats, cheeses, bread, tea and coffee. And so I made a plate up and a cup of tea, and took myself back to the settee to scroll through my phone. The next thing I recall is I wake up on the settee. I must have dropped off. And now, here I am in a strange location in the pitch black. Well, not quite. As my eyes adjust, I can see there is a low, green luminescence, highlighting the chairs, table, and other obstacles in my path between the settee and the bedroom. The light continues as I slowly walk from the living room to the hallway, up the stairs, and into the master bedroom. I figure it must be from some sort of alarm sensor in each room. Maybe a small LED light that I just can't place right now. Well, at least the place is secure, I thought. I'm so tired I don't even remove my clothes, trying my best to stay in a sleepy state. I just peel back the top sheet and slide into the large bed. Celine was right. It was so comfy and I sleep right through to the morning. My placement was in a language school in the centre of Lille, and my first day of orientation went well. By the close of play, I'd made instant friends with a girl named Camille, and had two very interesting things confirmed. Firstly, Johan tries it on with every new female arrival, but is basically harmless. And also... My lodgings are apparently haunted. That's if the last inhabitant is anything to go by. Camille said the girl who lived there before me claimed she'd experienced all types of crazy and terrifying activity. However, Camille also explained that she was god-awful at teaching and believed she exaggerated or completely invented all of the paranormal events. She believes it was a way to jump before she was pushed from her position. At the time, I laughed the story of the previous inhabitant off. See, I just didn't believe in the paranormal. Such things are utter nonsense, right? I got home that afternoon and had a busy night of lesson planning ahead. The back room was already set up as a study, complete with a leather reclining office chair and a lovely mahogany desk situated under a window which overlooked the rear of the garden. I set up my laptop and headed downstairs to make a cup of tea. On my way back through the living room, I saw that I'd left a bag with all my folders in on the coffee table in the middle of the room and after weighing up the situation, I decided I could carry both that and my hot tea in one trip. I precariously picked up the bag, heaved it onto my shoulder, and slowly headed up the stairs, being sure not to spill the hot liquid. I made it up, placed the cup down, the bag down, and took a deep breath. I was about to take my seat when something outside caught my attention. There was a tree at the far boundary of the garden, slap bang in the centre, the branches of which were moving around in the slight autumnal breeze. The light was fading from the sky, but was still strong enough 
to see the garden in its entirety. And I couldn't be sure, but it looked like a figure, all in black, was stood behind the tree, peeking out around the trunk. I froze, puzzled, and tried to focus more on the object. It clearly appeared to be the head and shoulders of a person, covered by a black material, which, as I squinted, also appeared to be flapping in the breeze. I'll admit it, I was freaked out. But maybe it was just a piece of material caught on a branch. Only one way to be sure. I headed down the stairs and was about to open the back door when I looked through the window and noticed it had gone. The view through and past the tree was clear. The dark seemed to be a bit heavier now, so I stood staring at the tree until I convinced myself that wherever it was had now gone. Maybe a gust had dislodged the material from the tree. Either way, I was satisfied that I need not investigate. I turned back to head back up... The coffee table had moved. I hadn't heard a thing but the coffee table was now halfway across the door to the hallway. I stood, frozen. Okay, okay, maybe one of my bag straps caught a corner and I moved it without knowing. It did seem heavier than I remembered when I first put it on. Yes, that must be it. I moved the table back and, thankfully, it was much lighter than it looked adding further validity to my reasoning. I headed back to the study and took a large gulp of my tea and paused. The light was more or less gone at this point and I couldn't be sure but it looked like the outline of the figure was back. This time stood further out from the tree. I shook my head, closed the blinds and carried on with my work. This was ridiculous. I was letting my fears get the better of me. Or so I thought. I worked until at least midnight, powering through with music playing through my phone as I typed. Once I realised that my spelling was starting to suffer, I finally submitted and closed down the laptop. I headed down to make a glass of water for bed. Thankfully, Everything was as it was. The coffee table unmoved from its position in the centre of the room. With the sheer meditative effect of typing for so long, and feeling more familiar with the house in general, I actually felt rather at peace heading to bed. I picked up my book, and possibly made it through half a page, before my head began nodding. So I put it down and turned out the light. That evening, I awoke in the early hours to a sound. It was as if someone was on the stairs. No, it was as if someone was intentionally trying not to be heard on the stairs. I slowed my breath in an attempt to heighten my hearing. And that's when I noticed the low, almost imperceptible, green hue was back. My eyes darted around the room as I tried in vain to locate the source of light. And that's when my peripheral vision saw it. A figure, crouched to the right of my bed, as if in prayer. My eyes shot to it, but it disappeared as I looked directly at it. By now I was almost hyperventilating. The creaks were in my room now as if circling my bed. Meanwhile, as my eyes adjusted to this empty space to my right, a similar figure formed, again in my periphery, at the foot of my bed. I kept my eyes where they were in order to keep this figure visible in my peripheral vision. Then, I watched it rise. 
it slowly stood from what appeared to be a kneeling position. I had no option but to stare directly at it, and yet again it dissipated. There followed a moment of calm, silence, my brain frantically trying to work out a way to rationalise things. And then a pain, the likes of which I hadn't felt before, raced up both of my legs. I screamed and looked down the bed to find the toes of both of my feet pointed back at me in an unnatural way. I leant forwards to try and reach my feet, and that's when I saw the dark silhouetted figure straight on, no longer in my periphery. It was like it blinked into existence in an instant, and it had its hands on my toes and was pushing them up, as if trying to snap them off. The next thing I know, I shot up in bed. It was dawn. I pulled my feet up and inspected them. They were both tender. I looked around the bedroom frantically. A nightmare, right? Just a nightmare? No. This is the thing. It didn't feel like a nightmare. It felt real. Unbelievably real. Yes, I've had realistic nightmares, but this was different. Looking back now, I know this happened. And I believe that I actually passed out with fear until that next morning. The next afternoon, I ran into Celine at the local supermarket. I clearly looked as rough as hell, and even jumped when she tapped me on the shoulder. I apologised. Sorry, Celine, you made me jump. I smiled, putting my hand to my chest. Celine looked concerned, and paused before reaching out and holding my hand. You've seen them, darling, haven't you? She said. I forced a smile and pulled a face as if to say, I've no idea what you mean. But my eyes were already filling with tears. Oh dear, Celine said and pulled me in for a hug. I sobbed in her arms for a good minute or so. I finally regained my composure and pulled back, wiping my eyes. Oh God, I'm so sorry, I laughed. Sorry, I'm just really tired. What am I like crying on you in the store? Celine just continued looking at me with concern. You come stay with me and Robert, she said. No, no, honestly, I'm fine, I said. I'm going to ask my friend Camille to stay over with me whilst I get used to the place. Honestly, I'm fine, I said, attempting to reassure her. Her face didn't change as she stared at me and reluctantly nodded. I headed out without buying a thing and walked right to the local cafe for a beer. I called Camille and asked if she fancied joining me and, thankfully, she did. We spent the next hour or so getting to know each other more and more and I slowly built up the courage and, in a joking fashion, mentioned that I think I might be experiencing weird things in the house. Camille's face turned serious. No way. It's not black figures in the garden, is it? She said, putting her bottle down. I was taken aback. Uh, well... Before I could answer, Camille continued. That's what the other girl said. She said something was coming in of a night from the backyard and standing next to her bed. She twiddled her fingers as if to imply it was all nonsense. I laughed, but I felt like I couldn't speak. Ha, no, I spluttered and took a long swig of my beer. What is it then? she asked. Oh, nothing, nothing really. Just a weird green light that I keep seeing, but I'm sure that's just the alarm. Camille straightened her back. No way, she said, her eyes widening. What? I asked. That's what she said she saw too. But Johan checked and there's no lights on those alarm boxes. I wanted to scream, but just slowly kept drinking. 
I finally lowered the bottle and shook my head. It's, it's probably nothing, I said, and quickly changed topic. Over the next drink, I built up the confidence to casually ask if she fancied carrying on drinking back at my place. Maybe she could even stay over if she wanted. I hoped beyond hope that she would say yes. But she said she had to babysit that night and couldn't have more than a few beers. Seeing my disappointment, she suggested that maybe we Skype each other later on to keep each other company. I jumped at the chance to not be alone that night, even if it was just a friendly face through a computer screen. I headed back to that store before heading home, picking up two bottles of strong white wine. I needed it for that evening, if only to knock me out for the night. When I got home, I was slightly buzzed from the beers, and I began to get angry. Angry that I was scared in the place I lived. I glared at the tree in the backyard, flung open the back door and stomped towards the tree. It was just a bloody tree, and no way was I going to be scared of wind and shadows. Confronting this tree seemed like the logical first step in conquering my fears. I reached the tree and investigated the back of it. There wasn't even room for someone to be stood there. So there you go. It was clearly just my... My vision became dark. Some sort of material had been placed over my face. I could barely see out through the small holes in the fabric. I screamed and ran back into the garden, reaching up and pulling at whatever was on my face. But my fingers touched nothing. I shook my head, bent over and ragged at my hair with my fingers. Get off me! I yelled. Finally looking all around as I quickly walked backwards, almost falling as I did so. And... nothing. No material on the floor. Nobody around. It was a calm day. There was no wind. Nothing could have blown against my face. I ran back into that kitchen and poured myself a huge glass of wine. That evening around 10pm, I Skyped Camille, waiting anxiously as the ringtone played through my laptop speakers. A wave of relief came over me as she answered and her face blinked into view. Hey, she said as the connection was made, and I think I audibly sighed with contentment. Camille was so funny. It was one of the reasons I loved her so much. I mean hysterically funny. She made me scream with laughter. They say laughter's the best medicine and it's true. And my God... Did I need it? She was doing an impression of Johan, which made me lean back for breath with laughter. Thank God the chair was a recliner. As I threw my head back and wiped my eyes while staring up at the ceiling and fighting to get my breath. But that was it then. I was drunk and I had the giggles. Camille said another sentence in her Johan voice, and again I lost it. I flung my head back in the chair, staring at the ceiling, wiping my eyes. Only, it wasn't the ceiling looking back at me. It was a black head and shoulders standing behind the chair, leaning over me, inches from my face. I screamed and spun around. Nothing was there. Did you see that, Camille? I said, glaring back at the screen. Call ended was showing where Camille's face had been seconds before. I sat in total silence. It was Camille. I answered the phone but dropped it in my hastiness. I finally picked it up and held it to my face as I headed out of the study. Hello? Hello? I shouted. Hey, sorry, my connection's terrible said Camille. Did you see that? Tell me you seen that, I shouted. Seen what? asked Camille. Are you okay? I sidewards walked down the stairs, keeping one eye on the door of the study. No, Camille, no, I'm not. Why, what's happened? she replied, sounding concerned. 
but I didn't reply immediately. I'd reached the bottom of the stairs and was too busy focusing on the low green light which was now spilling into the hallway from the living room. Camille, I said, and then the corner of the coffee table jammed itself into the doorway as if something had tried to forcibly push it into the hallway at the wrong angle. I fumbled the front door open and ran out of the house, not stopping until I was on the other side of the street, staring back at the now silent and dark home. Camille picked me up that evening, and I told her everything that had happened. It doesn't matter if she believed me or not. What mattered was how she acted. And she acted like a true friend. I stayed with her until Johan, after much coercion from Camille, found me a new place to stay. The monastery home was taken out of the accommodation pool for the agency that very same month, meaning no one else had to endure what I did in that god-awful place. Two weeks into living in my new apartment, I looked out of the window and saw Johan walking down the path with a bunch of flowers. Oh God, I thought, he's going to ask me out. I braced myself and opened the door. Hi, Johan, I said, preparing my excuses in my head. Hi, he held out the flowers. These are from Celine and Robert. He handed me the flowers, nodded, smiled, and walked back down the path. Well, what a big-headed idiot I felt. I placed the flowers on the table and pulled out the attached card. It read, We are both so sorry for what happened. May you find the peace you deserve in your new home. Your friends, Celine and Robert. Now, some years on, I still have that card in my purse. I keep it as a constant reminder to never jump to conclusions, and that, as has been said many times before, there is more out there than we will ever, ever understand. I want to thank Wendy for taking the time to write down and send in her true paranormal experience, and I meant every word I said at the start of this episode. The visions from that story specifically the person at the end of the bed bending her toes back towards her, has stuck with me since I read it. There have been very few nights that I've not given an extra cursory glance towards the foot of my own bed before going to sleep. Now, although it's exceptionally unlikely that they listen to this show, the one person I would truly love to sit down and have a conversation with is Celine. The very fact she says within the story, you've seen them too, implies she has tales from many a tenant gone by about the things within that monasterial home. So Wendy, although highly unlikely, if you could make that connection, I would truly appreciate it. And that brings us to the end of another episode. As ever, thank you for choosing to spend your time with me here in the Dark Paranormal. For our Patreons, I'll speak to you on Sunday for another episode of Dark Bites. And for everyone, I'll see you here next week for episode 7. Until then, remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave your disbelief at the door. And I'll speak to you next time, here, on the Dark Paranormal. With Kroger Free Pickup, the savings are always with you. So you get the same great deals as in-store right in the app. 
add your family's favorites to your cart while at the zoo, the science fair, or wherever. No matter where you order Kroger pickup from, you can stay on budget while easily stocking up on everything you need. So start your cart and save from wherever today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. $35 order minimum. Restrictions may apply. Subject to availability.